So when it comes to 18 months of hormone therapy, that, that sounds like a lot of time. So can you explain to the audience why there would be a benefit in taking that hormone therapy in comparison to maybe getting surgery or other options? Yeah, it is a big investment in terms of um, quality of life issues. And uh, we have videos, thankfully, that you can look up and find out how to minimize those side effects. But the logic is pretty strong. If there's a high likelihood of, of a spread of cancer outside the gland when someone has a high Gleason score or high PSA, the um, idea of doing surgery and then waiting for the cancer to come back basically gives those specks of cancer that are already out there a head start. And they, uh, by the time they're detected one, two, or three years later, they um, are much more entrenched and more, more difficult to dislodge. So the thinking of hormone treatment at the time of radiation, and you can even do it at the time of surgery, is to eliminate those little tiny specks when they're still vulnerable with uh, hormone therapy, which we know is a very powerful anti-cancer maneuver. So this idea of adjuvant hormone therapy is uh, uh, effective. It's used in breast cancer. There's adjuvant immune therapy in melanoma, adjuvant chemotherapy in lung cancers and pancreas cancers. This whole idea of going after microscopic metastasis at the get-go rather than waiting and giving it a head start is the uh, rationale for the hormone treatment. You had mentioned that um, maybe a short course of hormone therapy as well when it comes to glycinate, and including with the uh, radiation. So it, with that hormone therapy, is it standard first generation Lupron? Do you see a better effect with any of the other hormone therapies? Uh, so short course hormone therapy, which that would be four months. Longer course would be 12, 18 to 24 months. Uh, I would say with most high-grade cancers, we're looking at longer-term hormone therapy, but this is being modified with these new scans. And, and of course, people that have little amounts of 4 plus 4 have what we call favorable high risk. They could probably go with a short course of hormone therapy. But to answer your question, you're uh, alluding to the second-generation hormones like Extandi, Erlita, and Nubeca, or Zytiga. And if you are embarking upon hormone therapy to try and um, take care of any microscopic metastasis, I really believe you should be on the most efficacious, most powerful hormone therapy possible. The side effects really aren't much worse than Lupron. Uh, so a combination of Lupron plus Extandi, Erlita, Nubeca, Zytiga uh, for 12 to 18 months would be a very logical thing to do. With that being said, do most oncologists do that type of course? Are they automatically going to add a second generation hormone therapy to the first, or is that uncommon? Well, of course, policies vary to a shocking degree, and this is why patients need to educate themselves about what's going on. There's good data showing that in people that have confirmed spread to their lymph nodes right around the prostate, that they should be on a second generation hormonal agent from the get-go. Uh, if there's no proof of lymph nodes, if it's just a suspicion, we don't have solid data showing that men will benefit by being on a second generation hormone therapy. But I think it's logical considering that there's little if any additional side effects and we know it's more effective. So logical um, is not something that uh, all the doctors that are doing general medical oncology have thought through. I mean, most of these doctors are treating 100 different cancers and so they'll probably tend to go more by the book, but I think patients might want to broach that subject as to, doctor, wouldn't it be better uh, for me to be on the best and most efficacious hormone therapy since we're trying to uh, optimize my cure rates? So in regards to sequencing, does the patient start the hormone therapy and then go into IMRT or brachytherapy? What, in what order would they normally get those treatments? Right. So based on some work by Dr. Mac Roach, a very famous uh, radiation therapist at UCSF, uh, the historical process was to go on hormone therapy for 60 days and then start on the radiation thereafter. Um, the data on a recent recheck didn't hold up as clearly, and so there's actually quite a bit of flexibility. It's still uh, common for people to get the hormone therapy for a period of time and then start the radiation. Hormone therapy is so powerful, it takes the pressure off and think, oh, we've got to get to the radiation right away, the cancer will spread. People's uh, PSAs after the first 30 days usually drop 90% when they get on the hormone therapy. It's very powerful as an anti-cancer maneuver. So, so there's a lot of flexibility, honestly. Uh, traditional approaches wait about 60 days, then do the radiation. 
but that's no longer chipped in stone like it used to be. And when you get the radiation, you're getting the seed implant and then the IMRT on top of that, possibly? Yes, uh, they can sequence it either way. Uh, usually, the lion's share of the radiation is by the brachytherapy, by the seed implant, and one of the the brachytherapist may not be the same radiation doctor that does the IMRT or the SBRT. And so uh, the brachytherapist sort of becomes the captain of the radiation ship, sets the agenda, and they'll often want to do the treatment first, wait three or four weeks, and then they start the beam radiation portion. So after a patient goes on hormone therapy, has the brachytherapy, and then does IMRT, what should their PSA be and after what time frame to know that that was an effective course of treatment? Right. So... The, with no radiation at all, the PSA should drop to less than 0.1 within about five months of starting hormone therapy. So we expect the PSA on hormone therapy to go to undetectable levels and to remain there throughout the time that men are on hormone treatment. After the hormone treatment has stopped, the testosterone levels will recover. And because men with radiation still have a prostate, their PSA will come up a little bit, maybe up to 0 0.2, 0 0.4, and it should remain there for the rest of their lives, assuming they've been cured, which most men with high-risk disease will be cured. The only confusing thing is that sometimes a year, two, three, four years down the line, you can develop uh, delayed radiation prostatitis, a form of inflammation in the gland that can artifactually cause the PSA to jump around. It's called a PSA bump. In the past, we just kind of waited it out and the PSA would come back to normal without any treatment whatsoever. Uh, in this modern era, we can do these PSMA PET scans and make sure that there's no cancer lurking, even though we know that bumps are fairly common. So how long does the bumps normally last, like the radiation bump? It can vary from two months to two years. Uh, yeah, it's and the, how high does the PSA go? The highest PSA I've seen is uh, PSAs that have gone all the way up to 15 in men that did not have cancer. So a typical bump might be one, two, or three points, but uh, and probably lasting three to six months. When it comes to that bump, how many times do they need to get imaging to keep checking? So is it every three months, every six months? Like, what is the course of action to know that we don't have cancer somewhere lurking? We historically didn't have an accurate scan. So the, um, the, uh, the scans, I would say, aren't even mandated. It's just nice to know that we can look. Uh, the pattern of a bump is for the PSA to kind of jump up, and if you were graphing it, you'd see sort of a zigzag pattern uh, demarcate, um, showing inflammation. Um, cancer recurrences tend to rise in a steady, unremitting, predictable, uh, you know, up, 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 and up. And so, uh, so you can kind of tell by the pattern if you're checking the PSA every month during a bump, is it a bump or is it a recurrence? Thanks for watching. If you would like more information about what we talked about today, you can visit our website at pcri.org. Go ahead and subscribe to our YouTube channel. You will get updates on new videos every single week and give us a thumbs up if you like this video.